Well, hi, I'm John Hart, and welcome back to Mr. America Hart. So listen, today's video is a extension or a play off of one of the original videos I did back in 2020. It was called Muscle Beach is Gone. And what happened at the time was I had gone down to Muscle Beach. Uh, you know, at, at that point, we were in the middle of a lockdown in Los Angeles. It had just come to sort of an end, we thought, where people were heading outside more. Uh, it was kind of known that the COVID-19 virus did not like or survive well in sunshine. And so people were outdoors a little bit more. So at the time, uh, we decided, well, we're going to go ahead and go down to Muscle Beach and shoot a video working out in the pit, in the, you know, the world famous Muscle Beach pit in Venice Beach. And so I went with my son, my youngest son. He was going to be my video man that day. And I was going to do a workout inside the pit outdoors, basically. It's an outdoor pit, but within a fence. That's why I'm saying inside the pit. When we went there, we came to find out that uh, everything was shut down. I mean, completely shut down. There was no access to the pit. There were high fences all surrounding the pit. And you can go to, I'll refer you to the video that I shot on it. Down below, I'll put the link for the entire video of Muscle Beach is Gone. And you can see what we saw that day. Uh, there was what we thought was, uh, you know, dog poo everywhere. And, you know, we're trying to you know, maneuver our way around without stepping in the dog poo. It ends up it was human waste. And so it was a gigantic toilet at that time uh, with a lot of homeless people. Venice Beach was shut down. The businesses were shuttered. Uh, nothing was open. The actual pit, as I said, was closed. No access. Uh, there were hardly any people, one or two people walking on you know, the boardwalk over there along where the businesses usually are thriving. It was a hot day. The sun was out. It was a weekend day. And all that was there were tents. Homeless people living in tents, huddled around mainly the bathrooms and also in the handball courts. So I won't go you know, too far into that. But look, you can go and look it up yourself in the video that I shot back then. And you'll see what we saw at the time. Well, what that did was at the time, it really hit me hard regarding the homeless problem in L.A. I was a resident in L.A. My family, you know, we all lived out there. And, you know, since that time, we've moved to Texas. We no longer live there. And basically, we look back and we say, wow, I mean, it's a different world compared to where we live now. Uh, homelessness specifically was on the rise from the beginning of the pandemic even before that, it was already on the rise. And there were already overpasses where underneath the overpasses of freeways, you would see blue tents and just tents in general with people living in them, homeless people living there uh, year round. And then it just expanded, it seemed, during the pandemic. And then it just erupted to where it was up and down streets all over Los Angeles. What was formerly known as Skid Row, which was sort of like a six block area uh, in, in downtown LA, was now just everywhere. Tents everywhere. Uh, on ramps, on or off ramps of freeways. We had tents everywhere. We had homeless people everywhere along train tracks. Uh, and again, getting back down to Venice Beach where I was and what I saw, uh, they were everywhere. And it was horrific. And the video that I shot got quite a reaction quite politically charged from, uh, you know, both sides, uh, conservative as well as liberal, just, you know, throwing daggers at each other. And so in my world, I started thinking at that time about, well, what can be done about this? And I really had kind of forgotten a lot about it because I, I really don't discuss it much, you know, since I've been here in Texas. But recently I saw a video on the Joe Rogan experience where he was interviewing Michael Schellenberger. It's a man who's running for governor, or he's claimed he's going to go ahead and campaign and run for governor against Gavin Newsom. And, you know, Michael Schellenberger apparently has a thing, you know, where he has a solution for the homeless problem in Los Angeles and in California. And it seemed, as I listened, it seemed like, you know, the man's intentions were that, you know, to solve the problem. However, 
as I listened to him, I saw and heard a bunch of I'm going to do's like this. And it did not sound like there was a ton of solutions, actual solutions, or at least the beginnings of solutions. So I decided to go ahead and offer up the solutions that I had come up with, uh, you know, discussion with clients over the last few years. And, you know, hopefully uh, if you if you all think anything of it, I definitely would love to hear your opinion down in the comments section down below. Go right ahead. I'll, I'll read all the comments. I may not comment back, but I'll read them. And then uh, if you know anybody who you think could benefit from these solutions, please present this video to them. I'm more than happy to respond if I get contacted by anybody having to do with Los Angeles. I'll be happy to help them out in any way, shape, or form uh, if they need more details on what I'm meaning by some of this. So let's just get into this. You see, I have notes today because I had to take notes on this. It's just too big. So I see three problems uh, that the LA homelessness presents. I'm speaking specifically about LA. One of them is that it's just totally out of control. I know this sounds pretty basic, but it's totally out of control. There's uh, approximately 30,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. I'm taking that statistic from the Joe Rogan show along with Michael Schellenberger, where they said there was about 130,000 or thereabouts homeless or 200,000 uh, in the entire state of California. I don't remember the exact number, but about 30,000 of them, 30 to 60, if I'm not mistaken. I apologize for not remembering the exact statistic, but it was massive. It was a massive number. And if you lived in LA, the answer to that was, yeah, duh. Yeah, there is that many. They're all over the place. And so it's completely out of control. And it's not just out of control. It's growing. Every year it's growing. I just came back from a trip to LA and it has grown just since I left. And I, I don't see the current uh, people in charge doing much about it, or at least not that I've heard of. Maybe they are, you know, and maybe they are well-intentioned and doing something, but uh, I've not heard of anything in particular. And so that's one problem. It's just out of control, okay? And that brings many problems with it. The number two thing is it's, there's a suppression of downtown LA as being a hotspot you know, for visitors or tourism, okay? Uh, you know, because it's pretty much an ugly scene. You know, we're talking about a place where uh, there's a lot of mentally ill, drug-addicted, poverty-stricken people, and they all live in tents or they're just walking around, a lot of them like zombies in downtown L.A. And I know some of this, uh, you know, may sound, some of the words I'm using, politically incorrect, uh, and I don't mean to disparage anybody. But I want to just, you know, give a little bit of a picture. If you don't live there and you, you know, like I did, then you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to give you an accurate depiction of what can be seen if you were there. Uh, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And I'm amazed it has not been addressed, but uh, at least not aggressively addressed, let's say. There you go. As a former resident of L.A., I, I can say for years, I was wondering why it wasn't being aggressively addressed, except for one time period. And I will mention this. Uh, during the time period when Los Angeles was courting the Olympic Committee for, uh, for the Olympics, I believe it's in 2028, Los Angeles is going to have the Olympics, the Summer Olympics. Uh, when they were courting the Olympic Committee, miraculously, during a two-week period, there were no tents to be found on overpasses, underpasses, or on ramps and on off ramps, as well as downtown LA. So miraculously, they were gone, just gone. And then I found out from some of the residents that they were pretty much escorted to the outskirts of town. Tents were just picked up, thrown in trash bins by the city. And so, you know, that to me was creating a false picture of what it is. And maybe during the Olympics in 2028, they'll finally clean it up again during that time period. But uh, it, it obviously was being cleaned up for the Olympic Committee. And they did get their wish, and they are being uh, held in 2028 in Los Angeles, which is good for them. I hope it helps them out a lot. But inevitably, with that many uh, tents, with that many homeless people on all, like I said, overpasses, underpasses, on-ramps, off-ramps, and then sidewalks in front of businesses as well as apartments, the inevitable is there's not enough toilets to go around. A disease is going to be an issue at some point in time, if it isn't already. And uh, while I'm on that one, uh, one of the answers 
that the mayor of Los Angeles had. And, you know, God bless him. I hope that he can, you know, get all the answers and solutions. One of the answers that he had was to put porta potties right in the middle of a lot of these tented areas to make sure that they had toilets and uh, showers and garbage cans so that they could throw their garbage in the garbage cans. Um, you know, not really a solution, if anything. You know, giving the amenities of home to a bunch of homeless is pretty much saying you can stay here, it's home, and we'll provide those amenities for you, along with all of the food that they do get. Uh, and that's a whole other story. But you see what I'm saying? is that they, rather than finding a way of cleaning up the whole situation, they decided to put toilets, outhouses there, and garbage cans, and uh, some makeshift showers so they can get cleaner. Uh, Sort of like putting a Band-Aid on a leaking dam, okay? Uh, That's the way I saw it, at least. This is purely my opinion as we go. And then the third problem is that uh, where do you put the homeless if you remove them from the streets of LA. You see, removal in and of itself of anybody who has, you know, human civil rights, uh, taking them where they don't want to go is a problem. However, uh, there were originally vagrancy laws that were set up in most major cities, and they're not being enforced in any way, shape, or form in Los Angeles. So the local government in Los Angeles has decided that it's okay to pitch your tent on any public sidewalk anywhere in Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, if you bought a brand new condo, I've seen a a section of this. It's in uh, Echo Park. In Echo Park, there's uh, beautiful condos. Beautiful. And uh, not even better, even better. On Alvarado and the 101, on that intersection, there's an overpass. And underneath that overpass have been tents. They've been there for at least a decade. This is not something due to the pandemic. They've been there for at least a decade underneath that overpass. How do I know? I used to drive to a client's house once a week, every week. I've done that for 14 years prior to moving out of the state. So I saw it for at least a decade. Right next to that overpass, we have beautiful condominiums. People have paid a lot of money to live there. And there are tents lined up along the sidewalk right in front of those condominiums of homeless people. And that's of all types, whether they're mentally ill, drug addicted, just simply homeless, came on hard times, poverty struck, and any one of those or any combination thereof, they live there. And the city leaves them alone. They've just taken up residence there. So my point, as I'm rambling on about this part, is if there's no enforcement of a vagrancy law, then you're going to end up with people all over the place, anywhere they want to be. And that's what's occurred. Okay, so temporarily speaking, for the health of the residents of Los Angeles, okay, it can be done under such an umbrella of the health, because certainly disease will come with homeless people. And that does mean they are urinating and defecating on the sidewalks and in places they shouldn't be. It is just a fact. You just have to walk through any one of the little encampments and you will smell the truth. Okay. So with that being the case, disease will run rampant. Anything that's threatening the health of the residents is cause enough, reason enough to airlift those homeless right on out of there. Now, how do I go about doing such a thing? I have an answer for all all of these problems that I just mentioned, uh, and they are interconnected. So hopefully, if you follow me through this, you'll see what I mean. Uh, And I'm going to go to the third one. Where do you take the homeless? That's what I'm going to address first. Where do you take the homeless? Uh, It does mean moving them, in some cases, against their will. And again, in the name of the health and safety of the residents of Los Angeles, you do it. It's just done. It's got to be done. So shuttle them, bus them, do whatever is necessary for anybody who cannot prove that they have a home, an address that they live at, and that are found on the streets. Uh, You have to shuttle them out of there. And what is my proposition? Uh, Create two new cities. Let's just call them City A and City B. 
for a lack of any better terms. In my mind, I'm just coming up with city A and city B. City A, I see a lot of real estate in between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. It's wide open up there. Uh, shh, you can open up a build, a small city up there. And for that matter, it can be as high up north, somewhere between maybe Bakersfield and San Jose. But there's so much real estate in the middle of the state of California that's not farmland. Build a little city up there. And City A would house uh, the drug addicted, the mentally ill, and those with any kind of disabilities. And for lack of any other description, those that pretty much can't take care of themselves. That's where they're at. Okay. And City A would have a rotating medical staff. What do I mean by that? Well, back in the day when there were hospitals for the mentally ill years ago, uh, they were you know, rife with sexual abuse, physical abuse of the patients. And that was a result of a medical staff also that you know, was pretty regular, was working at those facilities. And over the time, over the course of time, uh, you know, whether it was a team effort or accepted or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, I believe that the head physicians in those cases, as well as the doctors that were on staff, uh, should have been rotated out and a new, an entire new staff brought in. Now, just so you know, I'm not talking about something, you know, completely made up in my head. Let's just go ahead and make it in the state of California that in order to have a medical license, you are required at least once in your lifetime to put in three to six months of service in the name of your state at City A, if your profession is dealing with the drug addicted, the mentally ill, or those with disabilities. And we give them free housing, of course. And if they're capable of you know, holding down a, a job, give them a job in City A that they do, you know, to give them a a sense of self-worth and value, something that they can look forward to each day in doing. Uh, yeah. And so a medical staff that is rotated out as well every three to six months, they're gone, including whoever the head doctor is, gone. They're not staying. But the entire medical staff is replenished or changed out in that case, any negative effects that could be experienced by any patients who have grown accustomed to or love their doctors at that point, any negative effects are pretty much countered by the lack of abuse that would happen by that medical staff towards the patient. So we're, we're talking about having a little bit more of a caring environment and those who are required by law to go and serve medical community by law to serve, whether they're doctors, nurses, pick it, every single aspect of the medical community that could benefit those in need up there, every one of them, just like jury duty, it's their requirement, it's their duty, it's their privilege as a resident of California to serve in that way. And so by doing that, they are permitted after serving that three to six month time period with expenses paid, of course, by the people of the state of California, uh, they will go ahead and be allowed to get a license after that and begin their regular practice and never have to serve again. So that's the way I see it. And then every time you have medical students or nursing students as part of their education, they must go and serve, you know, some sort of a, a uh, uh, internship up there at City A as well. Now, does that mean that it's a prisoner internment camp or something like that? No, uh, it being in a desolate area makes it so that, yeah, it's a, a little bit, isolated and you know nobody's going to walk on out of there so that needs to be addressed in some way shape or form but as far as the ones who would want to get out of there there may be some drug addicted who don't want to be addicted to drugs anymore and want to get a career or get clean get a, a lifestyle going outside of that and maybe there's some mentally ill who are no longer mentally ill as well I mean that could happen so Whatever the case may be, if they want out of there and the doctors deem them as being okay to be out there, then maybe they're shifted to City B. And which is City B? Uh, I like this one. Okay, I hope you can roll with me on this one. City B. Here I am. City B. 
So City B is going to be located somewhere in between San Diego and Calexico. On that eight freeway going east from San Diego to Calexico, there is a ton of land, I'm sure, owned by the state of California. Build City B out there. And what is City B? Well, City B is for those who are uh, wanting, they're living on the streets and they want out. They want to get back to a normal life or have one for the first time in their lives. Maybe they're, they are drug addicted. Maybe they did their time at City A, you know, got clean and now psychological counseling, all of that. And now they go to City B. What's City B? Job training, career training. It's job placement. You know, it's doing the the appropriate aptitude tests to see what jobs and careers will fit a certain person's individual personality. And then you train them in that job. Who's going to train them? Well, as a resident of the state of California, if you have a career in that field, I'm a personal trainer at that time, let's say, and you have some people who are there who have the capability or the aptitude to be a very good personal trainer. Well, the state of California would compensate me to go there and spend three to six months required, just like jury duty, three to six months, and I would train a group of residents in City B to become personal trainer. That's it, just like that. Teach them a career that they can go out, launch off afterwards, and start a career, right? So I just use that as an example, but it doesn't matter what we're talking about. A plumber, if you're a plumber, you're going to go ahead and teach them plumbing right there in City B with real life examples by fixing plumbing. Take them on the job. Show them the career right there in City B. So there has to be a City B first, of course. Uh, (laughs) So what else do I have on City B? Uh, Giving them proper direction and placement into a sustainable career. Yes, I like that. Uh, that same jury type system that's set up with professionals from every field required by law to serve three to six months, training former homeless people for a career. Okay, so that handles you know what we're going to do as far as where we're going to take people to. So we're actually offering a safer, cleaner environment for those more humane than being homeless on the streets of L.A., God knows what happens to them on the streets of L.A. once the sun goes down. God only knows, okay? Um, But the other thing, number two, the the suppression of downtown L.A. as a hotspot, as a tourism uh, attraction, as a visitor attraction, as something, I was a suburb resident in Los Angeles County. Why didn't I go downtown? ever, to do anything, ever, right? I mean, it, it's been at least 10 years since I've gone to a LA Clippers basketball game, you know, downtown Staples Center. Why? Why not? Why wouldn't I go? Well, because it's disgusting. You know, it's disgusting and it's, uh, it stinks, it's crime ridden, you know, all of that. So you could leave your car right there downtown. You don't know if you're coming back to a smash in windshield. You don't know if something's gone or if the car has been totally taken itself. You know, I mean, that's the chance you take. And the stories that you've heard about the enforcement of, you know, laws against such crimes is they're true. They don't enforce. So it's just, they can take anything they want. So begin, let's do this. Let's begin a downtown LA campaign that is welcoming to people from all over the world that downtown LA, the new downtown LA is being built up as an enter- not just an entertainment capital of the world, but also as a hot spot to come to for the best, the finest restaurants, the finest hotels, along with all of these entertainment things from sports to plays, the things they already have, but expand on them. Have more. Have more events. And guarantee that there are zero homeless Downtown, make it really the first city that has zero homeless. How is that going to be? Because there has to be a constant 
shuttle system going in and out of downtown, identifying anybody who is homeless and removing them to either city A or city B, or taking them to their family that is welcoming them back in to their homes. That's a more humane way of doing it, right? So, and then let's do this. Suddenly, with the removal of the problem of there being such an immense number of homeless downtown LA, new businesses will pop up. Businesses will be attracted. To, they'll want to be a part of everything LA at that point with the right advertising campaign all across the world, not just this country, all across the world. Businesses will pop up more and more all over Los Angeles. And with that, okay, to support, financially support City A and City B and all of the things that come along with the city itself, that does include a sanitation department, that does include a law enforcement department, that, again, is rotated in and out. You have all new law enforcement every three to six months required by law. You don't leave the same police force there that they can get stale and that they can get completely numb to what their real job is there, serving the people, serving the people of the state of California for the better of their state. Okay? So all of the things, not just sanitation and police, you also have uh, uh, a power department, you have a water department, all of those things. Okay? To support all of those, what do you do? You start a new tax. That's what has to happen. On the new businesses that pop up as well as the existing, there must be an additional tax. Let's just call it the LA, the beautiful LA tax, right? The beautiful LA tax of whatever it is, whether it's 5% per meal or 10% per room night at the hotels. Mathematically, this is what the administrators of the city of LA can figure out, the county of LA can figure out. What's the appropriate number? Experiment with it. Figure it out. Come up with a proper number for each business, for each meal, for each ticket bought to an athletic event, each ticket bought to an entertainment event. Every time the Oscars are held in LA, they should have an appropriate tax for each head, each person that walks in the door. So in other words, for every event, people will gladly pay that tax knowing that they're going to the cleanest, the finest downtown in this nation. That's what I see. Now, I left L.A., and it doesn't mean that I don't have great hope for them. So, an event tax, a room tax, the tourism will absolutely soar. And with that, each year, evaluate the numbers. How are they going? Do we need more money for City A, City B? Have it be actually transparent for the entire state to see. Put out a budget for City A and City B. And where are the dollars going exactly? No hidden anything on City A and City B. That kind of transparency will make it so that the residents of the state of California will gladly pay to clean that city up. It may end up being a model for another city, such as San Francisco, to do the same thing. So... All of the dollars from all those new taxes, uh, the beautiful L.A. tax, will go to supporting everything from City A and City B. And then lastly, my very first statement of a problem in L.A. with the homelessness is that it's out of control. Well, that right there answers the problem. It wouldn't be growing anymore. Okay, If it's a financial situation that people have had, well, they can go ahead and they can be hired on, perhaps, to work at City A and City B. Maybe keep a job there longer term. Maybe it's the answer for City A and City B is to rotate every job in and out and make it the residence of the state's obligation, just like jury duty, to go ahead and work a job there for three to six months, at least once in their lifetime. There's enough people living in California to do such a thing. And have that, you know, I call it a jury system because it's just like calling people for jury. Nobody gets out of it. There are no exceptions. Everybody serves. And that's it. So 
that's my answer right there. I know this was a long video, and I sure hope that something comes out of it in a positive light. I know I, I know it's likely that you know it won't be all positive to all of you who have seen this video, but that's okay. Uh, at least I came up with an answer, uh, a lot clearer answer than what I saw this guy Michael Schellenberger coming up with, and uh, a heck of a lot more of an answer than what I saw Gavin Newsom come up with, which is next to, in my mind, zero. So that's it for today. From my heart to you, John Hart, uh, looking forward to presenting you with a lot more videos on what I normally would cover, faith, fitness, diet, exercise, how to better ourselves in a physical sense, all of that, right? But that's it for today. Off to my left, you're going to see a disc pop up. That's the disc that represents the subscribe button for my channel. If you tap that thing right there, YouTube will let you know every time I come up with a new video and you can get to see them all as they come up live that day. And then down and off to your left, you're going to see right there a thumbs up button. Not as big as this thumb, but you'll see a thumbs up down there. Give that thing a tap, won't you, if you're liking the videos that I do, and turn it blue. The YouTube algorithm loves it and loves that my channel is doing so well. I appreciate you and look forward to